Greetings, everybody, this afternoon. Um, we are going to try to produce the most lively session we possibly can under the circumstances. I'd like to uh, welcome to the podium the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Echo Bank, Mr. Adi Adeyemi. Uh, Ekabo, yes. please take, take, take a seat. Thank you. Thank you very much. As, as you know, uh, Echo Bank is one of those pioneering institutions uh, that has always been on the brink of world stardom. And let's hope, uh, given the current uh, obsession with regional integration and continental in integration, it will, it will reach those peaks. Uh, of course, it, it was the bank for Middle Africa joining up Africa long before the uh, African continental free trade area was just a gleam in Paul Kagame's eye. Um, so Echo Bank has been doing transnational banking, linking economies across the continent uh, for a very long time. So we wanted to get into some of those issues and how uh, Echo Bank is going to play into uh, the, the move for more economic integration and convergence of currency zones, capital markets, uh, and all the other economic indices people want to see. Um, but uh, first of all, we're going to start on some questions about the themes uh, relevant to the, the, the topic for this conference, the, the diaspora, and how to to mobilize uh, the di diaspora and the role that financial institutions can, can play. Um, so I'd, I'd like to um, start now, if I, if I can, um, and make this a bit more uh, uh, human and personal. Um, thanks very much. Um, are, you, you're, are you mic'd up? I'm yeah. mic'd. Yep. Um, the first question is, you, you are launching new, a new product for, for the diaspora in terms of uh, remittances. Um, I wondered um, how you came to develop that, that, that project, uh, that product, uh, the sort of uh, research that informed that there was something EchoBank could really really capitalize on here. I think the current level of remittances to, to, uh, to Africa from the diaspora are running at well over 50 billion a year. It's, uh, in some countries, it rivals, it exceeds foreign direct investment. It certainly uh, exceeds the poultry aid budgets. Um, I wondered how you thought that EcoBank could, uh, could work in that market and, and make a difference. Uh, thanks, Patrick, and good afternoon, everybody. And thanks to Invest Africa for inviting us to be on, on stage. The way I try to approach the, the question is, it's a privilege to be here for EcoBank as an African bank. But that being here is representative of many other Africans that could have been here. So I'll try and speak from the industry perspective rather than just uh, Ecoban, because it's uh, late uh, in the afternoon, a lot of people want to drink coffee, I don't want to bore you uh, with a small uh, African bank story. The idea for all of you who are investors in this room is when you do an assessment about the demand capacity of the African continent and people, most people will always be looking and the GDPs of the countries alone. But if you are going to expand the demand capacity, you have to include the other African, if you put it together, the diaspora are more than there are a lot of people in diaspora. Depending on how you define diaspora, it could be up to 10% of the current African population. Uh, depending on how, you, how far back you go in history, if you go very far, a large number of the Brazilians are African in diaspora. If you go very near, we'll be looking at about 50 million people. And each of those people earn, on average, in terms of income, 
more than 10 times the per capita income of the people in the continent. And therefore, the ability to transfer money back home to, imp to improve the purchasing power and the demand capacity at home is there. And the responsibility, therefore, for the banking system is to figure out how to reduce friction, or remove friction in that transfer process. And all of us, both ourselves, the World Bank, all the rest of the banking industry, have been trying to create a product that people can want to and able to send money back to the continent pretty quickly. And we've come to the realization it is possible. The current level of technology, economics, and physics ensures that people can remit money to the continent in a friction-free way uh, almost instantly. Yes, EcoBank is present in 33 countries, and we can execute that. But with the rest of our colleagues, not just EcoBank, but the rest of the players in the African economy, that remittance capacity is there, that we can do it instantly. Historically, the challenges has been that the continent has been the most expensive from a remittance point of view. And that shouldn't be. And therefore, all of us are coming to the conclusion that it is better to increase the size of the flow rather than you know, make all the fees in the little flow there is. And therefore, the price has come down significantly. And a lot of people today are able to uh, do remittance. And EcoBank is one of the enablers of that. Next is most people, because it is not instant and it's not 24 7 52, most people sometimes have to wait until a particular amount of money has been accumulated before they can actually do the remittance. But again, because of the current state of economics and technology, you can remit any amount of money you want, $10, $10, pounds, $5. Pounds. As you see the money, you can get that done. And therefore, the flow becomes pretty uh, easy, and the, pro the flow can then happen consistently over time. Now, what that does when it goes through the official channel, rather than you sending money home through somebody, it then means that that can then get intermediated into trade flows, into exchange flows, into lending capacity for entrepreneurs that are present in the continent. And for the purpose of investors, therefore, when you are doing that assessment, you also need to start looking at that as part of the lending capacity of the financial institutions in the continent. And I just want to make sure that for the people in the room, that especially uh, people that are doing foreign direct investment, not just portfolio, because the portfolio investment is great, it's important. I listened to the last conversation about the capital market, and that is good. There is room for that. But the foreign direct investments, especially the, the big ones that create the uh, supply chain that allows the, the value chain, the SMEs to participate, is where a lot of uh, in, uh, employment is going to get created in, in the continent. But you count remittances separately from that, right? I mean, uh, there's a foreign direct investment. The, that, the invest uh, foreign direct investment and remittances and trade flows are different. Right. The remittances, uh, people end, they want to send it to the country, and it is not part, it's for most times consumption, it's mm -hmm. most times demand, uh, it's not question of you want to send it, at a, it's not for investment. Or it might be a small business or something like that. Yeah, you can send it for, you can send it for small business, one is small business. But at some point, if it is becoming business, then it's uh, direct investment. Um, how, how, how does it stack up when you look at the sort of, say, the three categories of remittance agencies? You've got the big companies uh, like Western Union, um, and then you've got a lot of smaller companies that have been undercutting the big companies because they've been charging so much. And I'm, I'm thinking of the, the Africa-based uh, remittance agencies, which are, I know are very, very popular, particularly in West Africa and uh, East Africa. And then you've got now the big financial institutions like your own. 
Um, how does that market divide up right now? And what, what are the, the relative merits, apart from, uh, I guess, for the user, the, the issue is speed, uh, uh, trust, and efficiency. But d d at the other end, is there, any, is there any difference? Is it better for countries to have remittances going through a, uh, the formal financial system like that, as you say, it, uh, it's good for the health of the financial sector that way? It's, it's better for the, for the remittance to go through the former financial system. When it goes through informal system, it's not predictable. The country cannot plan on it, and it cannot be intermediated. Right. Intermediation is important because the flow itself creates, put money in the hands of people in, in the continent. But then what do you do with the money? Because if you look at a place like um, Nigeria and the rest of the countries that receive money, if Nigeria knows that the, Nigeria will get $20 billion annually in foreign remittances through official channel, it's predictable. It will happen every year, $20 billion. That will be more than on a net basis, a net basis, when the country gets from oil. Right. And, and then the, the, the planning is going to be different. The way you transmit, uh, transform that money into trade is going to be different. The way you use that to to support the exchange of the government, uh, exchange policies of the central bank is going to be different. So I'm always, it's always important that we try and find a way to go through the official channel. Now to your question, so why won't people go through the official channel? Because there's a lot of advantages. It's because the official channel today is expensive, and therefore you need a good size and most people would rather give the money to somebody that is traveling uh, that will take the money back home. And therefore, the financial services institutions like ourselves, together with the development financial institutions and the African Union, wants to bring the price down and improve the quality. The price in terms of the fees that we charge, making the exchange rate very close to the market exchange rate, making execution almost instantaneous. Will that be a sort of voluntary agreement? How, how would you enforce something like that if the African Union said the, the remittance tariffs are, are X? How I, could that be done? I, I normally don't like other people determining the price of what they don't supply. Yeah. <laughs> so African so, Union needs to encourage the process, which will allow a free competition to ensure that the banking system behave responsibly, and the price is, uh, the current 7, 10% is just not acceptable. Mm. We cannot get good flow at those rates. So we believe that the, the price needs to come down substantially so that the flow can be directed towards the official flow. But I wouldn't encourage African Union or any other union to determine the price of what they don't supply. I mean, out of interest, um, what, what sort of rates are, is your institution looking at and how do those compare with the market? I think anything more than 3% is too high. Really? Yeah. Uh, if you're going to supply it instantly, if it's going to take some time to execute, then you should be looking as low as 1%. And, and, and then that makes it, you see, the issue, uh, that makes it, that is a level that can remunerate capital for supplying the remittance product, and that can also attract people that want to do the remittance. The continent has to then benefit. If it goes through the official channel, there are other ways for the banks to, to make money. Do you think there's more that, can be done either end to, to encourage remittances. I mean, for example, in this country, the rest of Europe and so on, uh, is there an argument for sort of, I don't know, tax breaks, some sort of incentive scheme uh, to get uh, people in the diaspora sent back? Because I know part of the argument is that actually 
already remittances are far more important than development aid, and, and in a way they're much better targeted than development aid because they, you know they're going to your family and friends back home and so on. Is there an argument for policy interventions on this? I think they have to be, the first thing is a recognition that there are a lot of people that are living outside their countries that want to support the economies in the countries where they came from. And supporting the economy in the countries where they came from will always help to keep people back in those countries and improve their demand capacity. We always talk about uh, migration and co, but if the resources sit in the north and the people that need sit in the south, the people in the south will come look for resources in the north. So there has to be a recognition that remittances is important and therefore the policy should support it. What we find is that a lot of conversation about remittance is as if it's some uh, quote-unquote black flows that doesn't need to be discussed in official quarters. Luckily, the World Bank is now shining light on it, mm -hmm. looking at the size and saying it's something that, that needs to be done. The other is recognition that if somebody is earning and is in the system, we need to recognize that there are lots of people that are living outside their homes that don't have papers. Right. Uh, again, depending on how far back in history you want to go, I know lots of people that are living in the continent that are not from the continent, that didn't have papers, but we now treat them as part of the continent. And a lot of people that are working that we should try and figure out how to include them in the financial and banking system so that that remittance flow can serve a higher purpose. And that recognition that it serves a higher purpose is something that I think the countries of the north where the uh, remittances mostly flow from. The rest of the African countries also have to recognize that there are a lot of Africans that are living outside their home country, and therefore those people also need to, to remit money. And African central bankers need to recognize that African central bankers need to recognize that the remittance doesn't have to go only to borrow the change. It's actually uh, much better if it flows through the financial system of choice by either the person doing the remitting or the person uh, receiving it. Once those things are done, uh, then people would demand based on who is the best that can offer the right service. And you're introducing some new technology in this. Uh, is, this is going to help uh, keep the costs down. I mean, uh, I think there's a, now is an Echo Bank um, remittance app. Is, is that another way to in, encourage uh, remittances, speed them up, bring the price down? The, the, the problem that we had was that between the person that wants to do the remittance, which is the initiator, and the person that is going to receive with the terminator, the connection between them historically has been bifurcated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, everybody is uh, able to charge, and it, sometimes it takes a week for the money to get uh, received. And what we are all driving to, which Ecobank is pioneering, and I try and make sure that I also recognize there are a lot of other colleagues of mine that are working on, in that space as well, is to use modern technology as a means of connecting. After all, the fact that almost everybody that is in diaspora or anywhere is always a WhatsApp away from the loved ones back home using the current mobile technology, then it should be the same WhatsApp, or one app, one click away from being able to send money to those loved ones. And that's what we've enabled. Overlay, financial technology, on the phone that enable people to make the remittance and make it very easy. So, so having done that, uh, it then opens the market or the current existing players that are charging much higher 
then needs to converge to a price point that is competitive, but that also offers the, the right service. So that will essentially be something like M-Pesa and the other mobile money schemes. Okay. I mean, it seems that we're now moving into an area with financial uh, transfers where there's tech technology is taking over. Uh, and I think M-Pesa now accounts for something like 30% of Kenyan GDP in terms of the number of transactions. Do you see that sort of growth in, in, both in remittances and in mobile money? And I, I, you're in that market, I guess. So you put a lot of things together, and I also want to make sure, sure it's relevant to people in the room. And I'm not doing a marketing a campaign for, do I always like to do that, but I want to be, uh, to, to be fair. Mpesa is a great product, and it's a great product because it allows inclusion in the country where it was introduced. Mpesa is a great product because a problem was solved in its including people in financial services, but the government of Kenya was ready to trade off control before for inclusion. They were ready to say, if you have a phone, you want to spend uh, 50 bob, 50 shillings, and co. They were ready to say, okay, don't worry. That's not where the most problems are. They were ready to do that. The second is on Mpesa, is that we're grateful to this country, United Kingdom, for allowing the uh, investment in the research that created Mpesa. And I think most times the country is not given sufficient recognition for the work that was done in getting that uh, up. But what we're trying to say here is that using the phone as a medium of enabling financial transaction is not just like Mpesa, it's just the way banking is going to be done uh, going forward in, into, the, into the future. The mobile money that you spoke about is again, by and large, the same thing. The money that exists in elect electronically that allows a large number of the people of the continent. Ultimately, creating a cashless economy allow us to create a frictionless economy and allow people to be able to participate. And it then becomes easier to take it back to why should people in the room care? It then allows more information to be available. In the days of big data that we have now, an ability to analyze that data, and therefore you can see a higher level of transactions that is passing through. Because most times, when we look at the GDP of the uh, African uh, countries, uh, we look at the GDP of, uh, say, Ghana, and you compare the GDP of Ghana to the GDP of York. And Ghana is much less than York. And you start asking the question, are we, not, are we counting this differently? Are we not able to assert, I mean, to be able to predict the right demand and therefore the right investment level in these uh, various countries? A lot of investment today is based on leap of faith, but including a large number of transactions in the financial system in a cashless way allow those transact those things that were happening and they were not being measured before to now become something that is happening and become measured. And therefore, you can, pre you can say, okay, there are lots of people that can actually demand this product uh, that uh, I want to invest in, in, in the continent. And then allows you to be able to make that decision in a much more informed way rather than trying to help the poor people in Africa. What do you think mobile money took longer to get established in West Africa than it did in East Africa. I know East Africa's more or less led the world in mobile money, but it always seems that you know, Kenya is a much smaller economy than Nigeria, but it's much far further ahead on the, the mobile money now, and then a, a lot of new apps, mobile loans, and so on. 
what's, what's the blockage in the West? As somebody that lives in Togo, which is a small country, sure. the quality of your contribution and the speed of what you can do is not a function of your size, mm -hmm. because you need leadership right. uh, to be able to, to create innovative solutions and to be able to put it to market. I think Kenya just uh, demonstrated a faster agility uh, than the West Africa uh, have been able to, to demonstrate. But ultimately, as we are now, the, uh, the playing ground is uh, by and large even. Remember, I have businesses across Africa, so I don't, uh, I don't favor West Africa, East Africa, yeah. Southern Africa, so I have to be careful that uh, I don't get any of my 33 licenses in Africa withdrawn for, <laughs> for saying something uh, out of place. But, but I think that uh, probably because Kenya did not have oil mm. and they needed to innovate quickly, and they've done that, and the rest of us have uh, learned uh, from them. But by the way, the payment system in, the, uh, in some of the West African market is faster than some of the US markets. Mm -hmm. And it's just a question of people who have a problem, they want to solve it, the current level of technology allows them to get that done, and we don't have investment in legacy systems uh, that will impair the institutions from getting that done. So today, across the continent, the ability to uh, make payment instantly uh, is something that we feel very, very, very happy about. We can, and we can do uh, payments across African country as fast as you can do fast payment in Europe. Kudos to them. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I just wanted to move out of this remittance diaspora discussion, widen it out a bit. You've just mentioned you, your bank operates in 33 countries. Um, right in, over the last year or so, we've seen uh, fairly static uh, projections for Af African growth, um, certainly of, on a per capita basis by the IMF, World Bank, even the African Development Bank. I wondered if you could uh, give a view on where you think we're going to be seeing the fastest growth over the next year or two and why. Um, I've just come from East Africa, for example. I know Uganda's about to embark on oil production, so I guess things are going to, to liven up there. Uh, any other areas we should be looking at in terms of uh, growth spikes and okay. why? I don't want to talk about Uganda oil. Looks like most people that have oil have problems. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and, and, and therefore, the, if you look at the, the continent in terms of the, the population, so we've got population growth of about 3% right. uh, there or thereabout. And therefore, economically, you expect that that's going to be the minimum level of growth that is going to keep yeah. the per capita income constant, and therefore 3% is the best level of growth that you expect. You expect growth to be higher in some of the countries that have low base, uh, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and right. co. And therefore, that is where we expect a lot of growth to happen. We think that a lot of growth will happen in West African countries, uh, the, the Francophone West African countries, mm -hmm with common regulation and uh, common, common regulation, common law, uh, common language, uh, common market mechanisms across uh, eight countries, uh, we think that those are addressable markets that growth will, will happen. And a lot of growth is going to happen because the government are responding to the infrastructure requirements of people uh, in the continent. And, and therefore, a lot of uh, with those growths, there are going to be a lot of investment opportunities for people in this room that is going to be able to need to, to respond to that. So the growth in the continent will continue to be uh, much higher uh, than the developed uh, market because there are a lot of things that need to be created that, has, that is not there. Uh, we still need to have all the roads built. We still need to have all the houses uh, constructed. We still need to have the hospitals built because they're just not there today, and therefore, those are things that need to, to be done. And therefore, you will see the returns people were getting uh, from the continent to be much higher than the returns people will be getting from the developed world, because 
In a developed world, there is sufficient supply. In the continent, there is scarcity. It's always easier to respond uh, to a supply problem than to respond to a demand problem. So supply problem is what is there. The people in this room can create, make investment to ensure that that supply problem goes away and the return will be much more beneficial because there's scarcity today. Well, thanks. On that note, uh, unfortunately, we have to go to the next phase. I see Ronnie uh, signaling. Uh, can I thank you so much for your time? And uh, I do uh, hope everyone's going to rush off and uh, get this app on their phone and start sending billions of dollars uh, to the African country of their choice. And hopefully, Theresa May will announce some tax breaks uh, before she resigns on, on Friday. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Oh, I should say it. Okay. <laughs>